Good morning and welcome to our service this morning on the fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm still church warden at St. Thomas of Beckett Church in Ramsey. But hopefully, after this week, we are hopeful that uh, we will be getting our new vicar. We do have a preferred candidate to all three churches agreed on. Um, and that person has been recommended. So now waiting to hear from the bishop that that person is acceptable. So actually, after a really busy Easter, we had a um, successful Easter club. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 30 children each day. Uh, lots of helpers came along. They loved it. Children loved it as well. And they were asking questions, or we were asking them questions, actually, about who is God? Because we make a big assumption that they know what we mean when we talk about God and who is Jesus? And finally, on the last day, what Jesus did for us. So it was a lovely three days. So big thanks to everyone who did that. And just looking forward to a slight bit of a rest this week from lots and lots of services. But welcome to you. And we'll begin our worship now with a very short welcoming prayer. God of the rising sun. Be the warmth that I feel. God of the gentle wind, be the air that I breathe. God of the refreshing rain, be the cleansing I need. God of the sacred space, be the peace that I crave. God of the setting sun, be the rest that I desire. So I'm actually going to use three readings this morning. First one is from Acts and I'm directed by Ely that I must use this uh, during the talk. So this one is taken from Acts chapter four and starting at verse five, I'm going to verse 12. So again, if you want to pause the video, grab your own Bible to follow it, please do so. So I'm now reading from Acts chapter 4, I'm starting at verse 5 and reading to verse 12. And this is Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin. The next day, the rulers, elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Anas. The high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. This is the word of our Lord. So in this reading, the Council of Jewish Religious and Civic Leaders, they met to decide what to do with Peter and John. In general, the council was religiously strict, but also quite corrupt and worldly. Hmm, who does that remind us of? It exploited the people of Israel. It wished to hold on to its political power as a priority over serving. Jesus' ministry had threatened that power, and now Jesus' disciples are continuing to threaten that political power by performing miracles and preaching the resurrection of God's Messiah. 
The Sadducees may have been the official rulers over Jewish affairs, but they were a minority party. They could govern only through the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court and Senate. And though the Sadducees made up the majority of the council, Josephus tells us that they often had to defer to the Pharisees' opinion. That's because the Sadducees were disliked by the common people and the Pharisees were held in high regard. As people interested in political power, is it not strange that the Sanhedrin members asked Peter and John, by what power or name did you do this? In other words, who said you could do this? Who was your leader? The apostles are faced with the same issue as Jesus had been. Jesus had also been teaching at the temple when he was confronted by the same general group of chief priests and teachers of the law. And they had asked Jesus, tell us by what authority you are doing these things. And now, months later, priests and teachers are faced with the Jesus question all over again, even though the ringleader had been killed. The Sanhedrin is not too pleased with the apostles, to put it mildly, but on what grounds are they going to punish Peter and John? You can't accuse the apostles of faking a healing. I mean, the evidence of the lame man, he's jumping and leaping around, it's incontrovertible. He's known by everyone. Well, he was over 40 years old and he'd been begging at the temple for many years. His sudden loss of lameness can't be explained away as a delusion or a secret healing process. Perhaps the apostles have an unlawful agenda in mind. Perhaps they're healing through the power of the devil. This is what Jesus was accused of doing in Luke's gospel. So that possibly explains the Sanhedrin's question, by what power or name do you do this? To be honest, I think there's an irony in the apostles' arrest. Peter and John are arrested for teaching about Jesus' resurrection, that they're actually questioned about the healing. The Sanhedrin didn't want to discuss the resurrection of Jesus, partly because the Pharisees were a significant minority of the Sanhedrin, and they actually did believe in resurrection. So although they didn't believe that Jesus had been resurrected, they couldn't disprove it. Too many strange events surrounding Jesus' life and death, including the empty tomb. And they'd be sure to come up if they open that can of worms. I think there's a stark contrast between these two groups, the religious leaders of the time and the apostles. The apostles are filled with the spirit, but the religious leaders are filled with fear of losing power over the Jewish people. They thought the business with Jesus of Nazareth ended the day they put him to death. Yet already, thousands of people in Jerusalem are believing and teaching in his name. Peter addresses the Sanhedrin respectfully enough, and although he is bold, he does not insult or attack them. Everything Peter says is factual and logical. He calls them rulers and elders of the people and points out the strangeness as he and John are on trial at all because they were responsible for a benefit done to a sick man. He implicitly argues that they've done nothing wrong. They help someone in need. As the story continues, you might want to read that themselves, the members of the council will actually be perplexed by Peter's boldness and by the witness of the formerly lame man in their presence. So they will meet privately to determine what to do. They will then order Peter and John not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus any further. <laughs> but Peter and John are going to make it clear they have no intention of obeying that command. The council will be stymied by the popularity of the apostles with the people. So I hope that gave you a little bit of background into Acts. I always find it amazing that somebody like Peter, this frightened fisherman who denied Jesus, is now, thanks to the power of the Holy Spirit, standing up and giving them what for. So I'm going to move us on now to our uh, gospel reading, which is taken from 
John chapter 10, and I'll be reading verses 11 to 18. So the Gospel of John, chapter 10, starting at verse 11, I'm reading to verse 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. This is the word of our Lord, which I say thanks be to God. And the other little section that I'd like to read is actually um, from the first book of John. And I'm looking at chapter 3 and starting at verse 16. So the first book of John, which is towards the end of the Bible, and I'm starting in chapter 3 and beginning verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set out our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. So for the last three weeks of Easter, we've listened to some wonderful gospel stories about the resurrection. The women who find the stone already rolled away and the tomb empty. Jesus meeting Mary in the garden when she thought he was the gardener. Jesus appearing to the disciples in the upper room, eating fish with them encouraging them to touch his wounds and his side. So far, so good. We believe with joy that Jesus rose from the dead and is the Son of God, just as he said he was. Have you ever wondered what sort of character Jesus really is? What he thinks about what's important to him. Two readings we've just had from the Gospel of John and then John chapter 1 a very different emphasis. And for the next sort of four weeks up to Pentecost, we'll not hear so much about the miracle of Jesus' his resurrection and his appearances to his disciples. We'll hear about his person, what his divine nature is like, what is important to his kingdom. You will hear him speak of how much he cares for us and how he prayed authentically for his disciples making clearer the importance of love and abiding in his love and how he saw this as necessary for building his kingdom. 
Today, that different emphasis starts and we go back before the resurrection and before the crucifixion, the chapter 10 in John's Gospel, where we hear Jesus speak about himself with one of the most well-known images, I think, in the Bible, being the Good Shepherd. Shepherding was a, a common occupation in the Middle East. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were all shepherds, as was Moses and, of course, David. 1,000 years before Jesus was born, Psalm 23 describes the peace and nourishment that comes from following the leading of God, the shepherd. This Christian metaphor of a shepherd and his sheep is one that we can relate to in the church today. Because as God's children, each of us has a real tendency to wander through temptation. We recognise too our helplessness spiritually to provide and protect ourselves and our loved ones from evil and sin. We know how much we need a shepherd to guide us through this earthly life. This morning, Jesus encourages us with three statements. He says, firstly, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The job of a shepherd was a lowly job and often a dangerous job out in the rough and exposed terrain. Sometimes a shepherd would indeed be required to lay down his or her life for the sheep. Jesus contrasts himself to the hired help who flees when the wolf appears. The good shepherd stays with the sheep. His actions speak louder than words. His focus is not on his own welfare, but that of the flock, their protection, their pasture, their safety. The nearer the sheep stay to the shepherd, the safer they will be. In Jesus' time, sheep were often raised for no other purpose than to be an offering for the temple sacrifices. And they would be fed on good pasture to fatten them up for slaughter. But here Jesus turns the tables and states that he would rather die himself than lose one of his flock. We can see that there is no limit to God's love for us. Because of his divine protection, no enemy can snatch us out of his hand. For the shepherd is always with us and will stay by our side no matter what. Next, we hear Jesus proclaim, I know my own and my own know me. The relationship between the sheep and the shepherd is built on familiarity. Sheep will not follow a strange voice. They recognise the shepherd and follow him. We may not think of ourselves as sheep. This is the term Jesus uses to describe his children. His sheep are all those who have trusted him as saviour. They are the ones for whom he laid down his life. Our Bible makes it clear how these sheep are identified. They know their shepherd, they hear his voice, and they follow him. And thirdly, Jesus says, I actually have other sheep who do not belong to this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there's going to be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus is referring to us, the Gentile church. To this point, Jesus has been reaching the Jewish people. But he looks ahead to a time after the ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit, when people from all nations will, like us, believe in him and follow him too. Today, in 2024, a third of the world's population are Christian. Different countries, continents and languages. Millions are hearing the gospel and numbers are growing. Christianity remains the largest religion in the world. Our world will not ever outgrow a need for the shepherd. And today, as we hear these encouraging words of Jesus, we give thanks for our good shepherd, who is so loving and faithful, who promises to protect, to call and to lead us all the days of our life. As we continue to rejoice in the resurrection, May we have the faith to respond when we hear his voice. Amen.
that that's filled you with hope and the love of Jesus. And you can hear his voice when he calls. You know that he's there to guard and save us and protect us. So let's just come to God now in prayer. Let's just pray. Lord, we ask for the courage of the Good Shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. We pray for those prepared to suffer and even to die for what they believe in. We pray for those whose lives and rights are sacrificed in the name of power and greed. We pray for those who risk themselves by accompanying others along the paths of deep suffering through valleys of fear and despair. Lord, we ask for the compassion of the Good Shepherd who leads his sheep to safe pasture. We pray for those who work to feed and shelter and educate the poor peoples of our world. We pray for those skilled at nursing and healing, particularly for those who are suffering or they're ill in body, mind or spirit. We pray too for those who care for victims of our society, those unable to cope with life and neglected, the abused. Lord, we ask for the love of the Good Shepherd who knows his sheep by name. We pray for our churches, for those who minister and teach, and all those who are engaged in any form of pastoral care. And now we pray for those that we know, relatives or friends, who are facing difficult times. Pray for ourselves that we might hear the call from our Good Shepherd and follow his way of life. We make all our prayers in Christ's name. Amen. And let us say together now the prayer that our Good Shepherd taught us. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'd just like to finish with um, a video clip, actually, a friend sent me. Um, and it was quite interesting, this person's take around Psalm 23, Good Shepherd. According to this psalm, God leads us in the paths of righteousness. So he's with me. His rod and his staff are sent to comfort us. The shepherd's going to have these to fight off anything coming to harm the sheep. So I think he'd have these in his hands here, protecting the sides of me. Anointing my head with oil means that God's over the top of me. And then he finishes by saying, love will follow me all the days of my life. So God's coming up behind me as well. Therefore, when I do enter the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because God's completely surrounding me. He's before me, behind me, the side of me, and following that back. It's also interesting about uh, the birth of Jesus and the shepherds going to the stable. I wonder what happened to the sheep. I mean, those sheep actually witnessed 
sky lighting up with the angels, singing. And then all of a sudden, the shepherds just take off. So did the angels stay and watch the sheep? No. And then there was the parable, wasn't there, of the shepherd who left the 99 to go find the one. And here, at Christmas, we've got the shepherds leaving their flocks to go and see the one. But not the lost one, the one that's never lost. Not the one that needs saving, but the one that's come to save. And not the one that wanders through creation, but the one that is the wonder of creation. I think the message for you is, leave those 99 things on your to-do list and get to the one that truly matters. So during the week, God of power, give us your spirit of love and self-discipline that we may live relying on your power and responding to your calling. Give us grace to make choices that will increase our faith and strengthen our obedience to Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Saviour. Amen. So a blessing to you this week. May it be a week filled with love, with joy. But if you are facing difficult times, Remember, Psalm 23, God's all around, front and at our side. God bless you. Thank you.